We began this series a couple weeks ago, and Elder Joe began to talk about grace and the importance of activating it in your life. And it is extremely important because when you look at what grace is, and let's go put these three on the screen here. It says, grace is the unearned, unmerited favor of God. It's also how we are redeemed. In other words, we have the forgiveness of sins. But grace is also our empowerment. It is God's empowerment that he gives to us to be able to overcome. And sometimes when you're overwhelmed, how many has ever been there? And some of us I know are even overwhelmed right now. And when we're overwhelmed and we have not just one thing. Oh, no, not just two things. Not just three. It, it can be multiple things going on and hitting you at the same time. It is God's grace that helps see you through. It is God's grace that helps see me through. It's God's grace that gives me the power and the strength to endure despite what my body says despite what my mind says and the thoughts that come to me, despite all of that, God gives us the power to overcome. In Romans 5, 17, it says, those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. We need to grow in grace, church, so that we can, we can reign in life. We receive an abundance of, of grace and when we receive that we have the power to get through we are empowered to get through anything that we face because church life is not supposed to surpass us we are supposed to be on top of life you know you know how many people just they you know they'll say something like oh life stinks or life is horrible you know because of stuff that's going on and maybe you have felt that way before maybe you you've said that phrase or phrases like that where life oh it's just terrible and I've done that too you know what I've had to repent from that and repent just means this I'm gonna change the way I think because life is is given to me by God so life is not supposed to stink life is not supposed to be awful Life is not supposed to be one of those things where I just, it's a, it's a drudgery. It's just every day waking up, it's awful. I'm supposed to be on top. So therefore, if that's the case, and I feel that way, that just means I need more grace. I need the grace of God. I need to go back to God to get more grace. See, in John 1.14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, that's Jesus, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth, there that, that, that's there again, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Christ was full of grace. Jesus reigned by grace. Moses ruled with the law. We are to reign by grace just as Jesus did. Life didn't surpass Jesus. Jesus was on top of life. Jesus reigned over sin, over sickness, over poverty, and over all the works of the devil. When he was tempted in the wilderness and the enemy came at him and began to tempt him. And he said, oh, if you're God, just turn that stone to bread. And he said, no, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Church, we are, everything that, that, that is within us should come from what we know in the word. 
What has God said? And then what has God said to you personally? As you pray, as you begin to pray in the Spirit, what has God spoken to you? You hold on to that word. It's not about the food we eat or the anything else. It's simply the power of God, the grace of God. Hallelujah. Church, when it says rain in Romans 5, 17, rain in life. Did you know, I, I mean, we're kings. That's what the scripture talks and is talking about. In other words, you're ruling over life. It is a, a, a new identity when we come to Christ. The scripture says we are a new creation, which means it means from brand new materials. And we're going to talk about that just here in a little bit because, see, we need to understand that we have dominion on the earth. That was the decree in Genesis that God spoke to Adam and Eve, and it is still in effect today. We don't subdue and take dominion over humans. What are we doing? We are taking dominion on the earth. Life is not supposed to surpass us. The things that we're going through is not supposed to keep us from doing what God has told us to do. In Luke 2, 52, it says, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and, and in favor with God and men. Church, Jesus grew in grace. He wasn't born and then was just full of grace. Amen. He was God and man at the same, but it said he increased in wisdom. He increased in favor. And the question I had to ask myself this week, am I increasing? Am I increasing? Let's pray real quick. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that our minds and our hearts would be open to receive this word here today. Lord, that we would truly increase in you. Lord, that we would have your empowerment, Father God. Lord, that we'd be victorious in life. That life would not pass us by. Lord, I thank you that all distractions are gone. Lord, can we just lay aside all things, just in this place right now, if you're going through something, just lay it aside for a few moments here this morning. Put it down and hear the word of the Lord. That's what I'm feeling right now in my spirit. Those that are listening online, do the same thing. Just put all of those things aside right now and hear the word of the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Remember, Jesus got to the fullness level. We can too. I can walk in the same measure of grace that Jesus walked in, that he had. Church, I'm blessed going in, I'm blessed going out. I'm the head, I am not the tail. These are the things that the scripture says. Whatever I put my hands to will prosper. This is what the word says. Are we standing on the word of God when we're going through something or are we just getting in our flesh? Are we just getting in our own way? Are we just going by our feelings? Church, I don't go by my feelings. You know, over the years we've needed, you know, volunteers to do different things or whatever. And we would go to somebody, you know, sometimes say, hey, what do you think about doing this? So, oh, well, I don't feel led to do that. So, you know, one minister, he came through and he talked about, he said, look, just get, you know, have you a fishing weight in your pocket. It's made out of lead. Said, here, hold out your hand and give them that fishing weight. Now you felt led. All right, now let's go do it. <laughs> you know, sometimes we just over-spiritualize everything. Amen. A amen? Sometimes we just need to do what the Word says to do. And the Word says to be a part of the body, the fellowship. This isn't in the notes, but I'm just saying, the Word... It says that, you know, look, imagine being in the fam you're in a family and you literally do nothing in the house. I mean, you do nothing. You don't contribute to taking care of the house, cooking, the dishes, the laundry, nothing. What are you then at that point? Can I be real honest? You're a leech. 
All, do you know what a leech does? All they do is suck. Uh, let's just be honest about it. Now look, you can, you can take from people and you can just suck from people or you can receive and you can give. And I'm talking about in your relationships, wherever you are. You can't just take, you have to give. Hey, what can I do to help? I want to help. I need to serve here, there, wherever. Not just here, wherever. Don't be a leech. Amen. All right, let's move on. Praise God. 2 Peter 3.18 says, but grow in grace. You know, Peter, when he wrote this, he wasn't asking. He was telling. He was saying, do this, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. God wants us to grow in grace. Every year we should be grown. We should be able to look back and see where we've grown. Mm. In, in, in verse 17, if we back up in 2 Peter here and we look at the New Living Translation and then read 18, look at this. I am warning you ahead of time, dear friends. Church, whenever you see I'm warning you, it, pay, pay attention, right? Be on guard so you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in grace. See, that's what, you know, see, he's going right into, and go back to verse 17, please. You already know these things. That's the <laughs> and this is what it, it this is what you know I, I get convicted of. I really do. Because when I start whining, and my wife knows, and life can get hard, and yes, it can get hard for the pastor. It can get hard for a preacher. Some things can go on and it's not easy. I already know that I'm supposed to stand on the Word. But what do I do? I don't think about the Word because I go by my feelings, you know. And I'll get carried away. And look, if you keep on doing that, then you get carried away with wicked doctrine, cultural stuff to where people are talking and saying this and that, and it doesn't line up with Scripture. Oh, it sounds good, but it's not. I have four different examples in my head on that, but we do not have time to go down that, you know, that bunny trail. But more specifically, what are we to grow in? Verse 15 of Ephesians 1 says, After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you what? The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of of him. God wants you to have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in him. Mm. Church, you have to be in prayer for that. You have to be in the word for that. You can't get that by You know what this is sitting on the couch. Or in my case, hold on. We got one coming up over here. Get him. No, left side, left side. We got to take Alpha. Look, I could do that all day. I love it. <laughs> My brother knows. I have all kinds of fun playing video games. I love the ones where I run around and I got a gun in my hand. I'm good. And I'm, I'm trying to take a certain point, you know. It's great. But church, I can't get lost just doing that all day. I have responsibilities, but not just that. I have to be in the Word. Church, if I'm not in the Word, I'm going to lose my mind. That's why, see, the Scripture says to renew your mind. And you have to do that by being in the Word. I'll lose it. i got stuff going on. It, it's not good, right? 
So I, to, in order to be on top of it and for life not to surpass me, I have to grow in grace. I, in order to do that, I have to be in the word. I have to be in prayer. I have to take time to do that. I have to get that spirit of wisdom and revelation. Church, you can be saved, baptized, filled with the spirit and still not have victory in your life. It's the truth. You have to receive wisdom and revelation. When we don't have wisdom and revelation, when you, you know, people ask you about how you're doing, how your, you know, walk with the Lord is going or whatever, you'll respond with, things, oh, I'm, I'm just trying to make it through. Just trying to stay straight. Trying to keep from backsliding. It could happen at any moment. It's just this stuff going on right now. It's just not a biblical attitude. It's not a biblical attitude. It's not what the word says. I can't go by how I feel. I can't look church. God doesn't want us just making it. Just trying to get by. Where one day it's like, you, you know, I asked somebody the other day, you know, uh, my husband one the other day. It's been a little bit now. And he's retired, and I said, I said, yo, so how do you like retired? I'm living the life. That's what he said. We got another retired one. I'm living the life. I like this. That's the way it's supposed to be, church. I'm living the life. God wants you to live a good life. Victorious, not beat up, busted, depressed, upset. Look, and I understand. Look, I, I've been there. We've got to be able to overcome. I'm above the fray, and I'm not coming down. I can only do that through the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm going to kind of switch gears just a little bit talking about grace. Because we need to talk about sin just for a minute. In Romans 3, 21, it says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, there's the popular one that everybody knows in verse 23. For all have sinned and come short, you know, fall short of the glory of God. But see, the scripture says there is no, when he said there is no distinction. What does that mean? Church, it means God didn't save you better than he saved me. He didn't save me better than he saved you. Your salvation is the same as mine. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are all in Christ. There is no distinction. And understand this, sin is sin is sin. A lot of times what we want to do is we want to rank sins, like the bad ones. And then we put the ones down here that, oh, like the little white lies or whatever, you know. Those are down there, like there is such a thing as a white lie. <laughs> you got the crap. I mean, a lie is a lie, right? Why are we putting colors on it? I don't know. I don't get it. I got a red lie. You know, it's like, whatever. <laughs> our salvation, our righteousness is the same. So we're to walk by faith. Not in reliving our past failures. There's nothing that you've done that can hold you back. The word says, I will remember your sins no more. In Hebrews and in Psalms, it says that. In other words, God's saying, I have nothing in your past to compare your future to. Uh, listen to that one more. I have nothing in your past to compare your future to. Why? Because your past is gone. It was yesterday. Now, yes, it's true that you reap what you sow, and maybe you've done something, and now you're reaping something that you've sown. But understand, even that, you can start commanding a crop failure. Amen? Don't allow that. You know, there's individuals who've been in, like, deep sin, you know, which sin is just, church sin is just this. It's missing the mark. I've said this many times. missing the mark. 
That's what sin is. I missed it. Now I need to fix it. Right? And there's many people who've been in some deep sin or whatever, and they feel like that disqualifies them from telling somebody else about Christ or serving in the church or whatever it may be. It doesn't. Now, there may be some things that happen or whatever, and you can't get up here and do what I do behind the pulpit. Amen, right? But it does not disqualify you from telling somebody else about Christ. Once you're in the house, you're in the house. You're supposed to be able to share Christ and open your door and invite those to come in. And when I say the house, I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Many denominations, they'll categorize sin and failure. They put a stipulation upon who can really attain and achieve the maximum potential for their existence. Church, that's demonic. I, I, know, I knew a brother a uh, long time ago. We, work, we worked together in a warehouse. And uh, he said, he, I asked him what church he went to. He was saying what Baptist church he goes to. And he, he goes there as long as he's not working. He did uh, the driving just like I did. And sometimes he did the weekend stuff. I said, I'm not doing the weekend stuff. I got a place to be. And uh, so he... He was telling me about a church he, he had to switch because he went to this one church and he was there and everything was fine. Everybody was so nice and welcoming. And he, I mean, and then a couple of weeks later, somebody started talking to him and asking him about, you know, and getting to know him and all of that. And he said, They found out I was divorced. And once they found that out, Everything changed. People stopped talking to me. They didn't smile at me. They were whispering. He said, TJ, I left. And I said, I want you to know. And I told him that. That's not God. And I told him, I said, God has forgiven you. That's in your past, brother. Don't let what happened at that church, I know that hurt, but don't let that hold you back. And I'm glad you found a church right now. And I can't remember which, it was a Baptist church here in town. I can't remember which one. I said, you just keep going. Amen. It's wrong. Mark Shell says this, learning to operate by faith again is in the ability to understand that failure isn't final and God is still your daddy. And see, that's what that brother needed that I was talking to. He had to learn to operate by faith again because I tell you, it was still affecting him. It was affecting his life. It was bringing him down the hurt. Sometimes the church can hurt you worse than the people outside the church. Right? Why? Because we get all self, we get, we get judgmental and all of that. Self-appraisal will always disqualify or nullify blessings in a believer's life. Stop appraising yourself. Your position is secure. Man, I wish I had that other mic. Boy, that thing is, I'm, I'm dropping it, ain't I? Can you hear me good now? All right. If I do that, just keep motioning. I'm going to hold it down here. Maybe keep it up higher. Hallelujah. Self-appraisal always disqualifies. That's what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to relive and go over all the stuff. All the bad stuff. You are his child. You are already approved. Church, I'm going to say something. And this, and I want you to hear me on this. And don't turn me off if you're listening online. And go, oh, that's heresy. Okay, I just want to listen all the way through. When a believer sins, it doesn't change his standing with God. I understand what I'm saying. He remains in right standing with God. Righteousness. There's two different types of righteousness. There's your position of righteousness, and then there's living righteous. That's two different things. Look at this statement. Righteousness is a gift from God and not the product of our performance. That's what Romans 5.17. 
It's a gift. Grace is a gift. Salvation is a gift. You can't earn it. How do I know this? Because look, in my house, when my son messes up, that doesn't mean he's not a Hall anymore. My last name is Hall. So when I mess up and I get angry and maybe I yell at my wife, that doesn't mean I'm not a believer anymore, church. It just means I messed up. I missed the mark right there. And what do I got to do? I got to fix that. Look at Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And, and look, I'm not saying it's okay to sin. It's not. Because it messes you up. You do reap what you sow. And it's not fun. You're not living victorious. You're not reigning in life. But that doesn't mean you're not a child of God at that moment just because you messed up. A amen? Now what do we lose when we sin that needs to be recovered if we haven't lost our standing with God as a child of God? We lose a clear conscience and confidence before God. In 1 John 3, 21, it says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. But see, when we sin, we start getting condemned. I, I mean, we'll do, I mean, we, I'll pour it on my, I beat myself up. When I mess up, I beat myself up. I'll start calling myself stupid. <laughs> I know where my youngest gets it from. Aaron says that all the time. When he does something, he messes up. He's like, oh, I'm stupid. No, like, no, son, you're not stupid. But that's how I feel. So, see, I know, that's, I know that's where that's coming from. It's how I feel. And I'll beat myself up, and I'm kidding. Now I don't have confidence. I don't have that clear conscience. There's this sense of guilt and shame, and it hinders my faith. It undermines my boldness to stand. And to have authority in Christ. See, in Ephesians 6, it says, when you've done all, stand. Now I can't stand because I've been in sin. And I've messed up. So I have to fix that. And now I can come back with a clear conscience. And as the scripture says, I come boldly before the throne of grace. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. We got to get this, and there's so many people in the body of Christ that do not understand what I just said. They don't understand it. Look, there's more there. We can go into that, and if you, you want more, you're like, oh, wait, you know, next week, don't worry, we're going to get a little more into that as well. I want to go, one, before I let you go, I want to talk about really quick, because I know some of you are going through some things. I know I've been going through some things. Your authority in Christ by grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said to me, we got to remember this, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. This is the dunamis. The strength is the dunamis power of God. Force, specifically, miraculous power, ability, abundance. Grace is the ability to do. It's might, power, strength. Another version puts it this way. My grace is all you need for my power is greatest when you are weak. Weak is inability while grace is the ability to do. Now let's read what Peter said. 2 Peter 1 verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Now he didn't just say forgiveness be to you. That's not what he was saying. Remember we got three definitions of grace. What he's talking about be empowered. The authority, the grace and peace be to you. Hallelujah. He are, they're already forgiven. He knows that. Grace and peace to you. Have that empowerment. Be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord as his divine power. See, that's how I know what that's what he's talking about when he says grace. He's talking about the power he's given to us. All things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The word nature is defined as the innate or essential qualities of character of a person, 
We have the same, church, get this, we have the same essential qualities as Jesus. Just as my hand is the same genetic makeup as my head because I am one human being, not two. Remember, John, Jesus said that we're one. Lord, I pray that these would be one with me and you as, you, as we are, right? So he says we're all one. In 1 Corinthians 12, 27, all of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. 1 John 4, 17, as he is, so are we in this world. Church, do we believe these words? Do we believe what the scripture says? I have the same genetic makeup as Christ. Look, I'm not God. I'm a child of God. See, there's people who go out there and talk, get these scriptures here, and they'll take it too far and go, we're gods on the earth. You've heard that one, right? We, oh, no. I'm not God. I'm a child of God. But I am in the family. I'm in the bloodline. I got the same genetic makeup. Amen. And there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. We used to sing that, right? And we say, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. I mean, we sing that stuff. Boy, the house was rocking. Hallelujah. Because Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. And so when something starts coming against, against you, say, no, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Get under my feet because Jesus is the head and I am his body. Therefore, all things are under my feet. Hallelujah. It says in Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. So I've got the power of God. So when I'm tempted, when I'm try, getting ready to get upset, no, I don't have to do that. I don't have to. I've got the same genetic makeup as Jesus. I'm part of the body. He's the head. And that thing called anger is under my feet. That thing called sin is under my feet. That situation that wants to get me to worry and stress, that's all under my feet right now. Worry and stress. Stress is not of God, church. It doesn't appear in the scripture, to, and it doesn't say, it's okay to stress out. It's okay to live in stress. God doesn't want you to live in stress. He wants you to have peace. He wants you to have life. He Be victorious and be prosperous. Amen. That's not prosperity gospel. It's advancing the kingdom of God. Because see, when you're right in your head, when I'm right in my head, when I'm right in my body, I can go out you know, inside how I feel. I'm not condemned. Now I can minister to somebody else and the kingdom of God expands. I said a lot just now. Did we all get that? Amen. Ephesians. You know what? We'll do that next week. We're going to skip a bunch of this stuff. We're going to talk a little bit more on the authority next week, and we'll get, we'll get to all of this. I want to get to the end for today, because this is what I, wanted to, I, I want to get, get to right here. Uh, yeah. We're just going to do this. All right, so back in 2015, I did a series called Amazing Grace. And I went back and listened to about 10, 15 minutes of uh, the message. And I, I, I wanted to bring this part out because and I wanted to hear what I said and be reminded about everything that God showed me. God showed me, and it was part three of the message, and God showed me that part before we started the series and before I did part one and two. And it was like weeks that I was holding this back, you know, what God had showed me. And, you know, I, years ago we, we got a dog. I'm trying to remember what year we had the dog. It was 2014. So he was a puppy. And we're sitting, uh, I'm sitting at the table. And I'm sitting at the, the, where I normally sit. And my dog, this little puppy, comes up there and starts pawing on my leg, you know. And then he sits down, and I look at him, and he's got that head cocked, you know, like with that little look. He is begging hardcore for what I'm eating. He can smell it. He's all about it. And so I say, no. And I go back to eating, and the next thing I know, he, done, he, he didn't just paw my leg. Both paws come up. 
and are on my lap, and his head's like right there. Who do you think you are? And that dog went right back in the floor. I put him right back down there. And I said, no, and I went back to eating. And then you know what he did? <laughs> He's doing that. And I remember, after listening to the message again, I remember and recall the whole thing. And the Lord began to show me. When that happened, the Lord said, that's you a lot of times. And I was like, man, God just called me a dog. But what he was saying is, that's what you do many times. And then I looked up, and my son, who was sitting at my right hand, who has sat at my right hand for years, he was eating, he was happy. My son never has begged for food in my house. Not since he has been sitting at my right hand in a regular seat. No, 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 we all beg when we're in a high chair. But after he got out of the high chair and he's sitting in the regular seat like a big boy, he didn't have to beg for food. That thing came on the plate right there in front of him, and he was good. Now, he may not have liked all those vegetables, but you know what? He didn't beg for food. My kids don't beg for food in my house. My dog begs for food in my house. In Psalms 23, verse 5, what a powerful psalm. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. It, this scripture right here speaks to me so much. It helps me. Because, see, the word is saying that you will be taken care of even in the midst of your opponents. However, it doesn't just say you will survive. It says that a table or a feast will be spread before you even while you're in the presence of enemy forces that oppose you. The Hebrew word for table is a king's table or spread. Remember, David was a king, and a king's table has a vast spread. Hebrews 4.16 says, Come boldly before the throne of grace, not come begging to the throne. I don't beg because I'm a child of God. I need to understand my authority so that all these things can be put under my feet. Hear me, everyone under the sound of my voice and everyone listening online. If you're struggling in an area of your life, if you are a child of God, you have the authority to defeat every single problem that you're facing. Every single one. The Spirit of God is within you. You don't need, and look, Doctors are great. Psychiatrists are fine some of the time. Okay? You know, counselors, whatever. All of those things are good. And I, I've, I have sent people to professional counselors before. I've done all of that. But one thing I've always told them as well. The Spirit of God is within you and can fix anything. He's greater than all of those things that we, you know, all, all of it. He can fix every bit of it. Charles Spurgeon, he said this, when a soldier is in the presence of his enemies, if he eats at all, he snatches a hasty meal, and away he hastens to the fight. But observe, you prepare a table. Nothing is hurried. There is no confusion, no disturbance. The enemy is at the door, and yet God prepares a table, and the Christian sits down and eats as if, as if, as if everything was in perfect peace. Do you know how amazing this, this is? Nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's what he said in Mark, I think it's 16. You can take up this, you can do that, take up the deadly serpent, all that stuff. A snake can bite you, you can eat something, it's not going to harm you. Look, nothing shall bite. What level of authority and power are we living in? What level and power of authority do we have by the grace of God? Mm. It's more than we think. Let's all stand.
more and more when I look at it, I realize that I haven't always been operating in the level and the power and the authority that God has for me. There are days and there's times and there's hours where I lay it down because of my feelings and how I feel. I give in to how I feel. I'm not supposed to give in to how I feel. I'm supposed to be victorious in life. The enemy is not supposed to harm me. The enemy is not supposed to have get one over on me. This Thanksgiving, when you sit down at that table at that meal, give thanks to God. But not just thanks to God for the food. Thank God for who you are. Thank God for who you are in Christ. This Thanksgiving, let's be thankful for that. The grace, the empowerment of God to overcome everything, even in the presence of our enemies, so that we are not allowing life to overcome us. We are reigning in life.